We love you this morning, Jesus. We love you this morning, Jesus. Come on, touch a couple of people. Let them know he's your peace. He's your joy and he's your strength. That you find your seat. Come on, let them know. 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 Come on, let them know. Give it up for the band, everybody. Hallelujah. 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 How you doing this morning, church? How you feeling this morning, church? How you doing this morning? Did you, did you come into the parking lot with Thanksgiving and into the lobby with praise? Yes. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you got a Bible, you can turn uh, into Philippians chapter 4. It's going to be a second before I get there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Hallelujah. You know, Christianity is, is, is political. Okay, I, I, I'll, I'll break this down another time, but literally, literally what we're called to is to be a city within a city. And a politic is a way of living together and living life. Don't let hateful people define your Christian politic. A lot of hateful people out there deciding our politic. We're called to be people of love and people of sacrifice. And a lot of people out there saying, you got to protect yourself, look out for your own interest, and hate them. Don't let them define your politics. Amen? Now, if you're getting upset with me, then I might be touching your idol. Because I'm not on your side. I'm on the side of Jesus. I'm not on their side. I'm on the side of Jesus. I'm on the side of peace. I'm on the side of the Prince of Peace. Amen? <clears throat> oh, I don't have time to get into that. I will, though. I absolutely will. I absolutely will. So, Father, I pray that you would be with us today and help me stay focused. Start my clock now. Thank you. We love you, Jesus. And everybody said? Thank you, Mike. Hallelujah. I know you're familiar with the story in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, um, we love this story because it's, it's how we all want to live. And it goes something like this. Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16 are in Philippi planting the church of Jesus Christ. And uh, we're on Paul's second missionary journey. And while they're there in Philippi, you know the story It's because, you know, it's about 10 years after the story of Jesus. And uh, we know this story uh, because there was a slave girl there, if you remember, and she could tell fortunes. And, uh, and her owner, uh, which should bother us, but her owner uh, would use her demonic gift to make him money from her fortune telling. And uh, she kept following around Paul and Silas and it began to irritate them because she would say, look, here, these are prophets of the Most High. These are prophets of the Most High God. And they got irritated with her, so they cast the devil out of her. And uh, her owners were very upset because she could no longer make money for them. And so the Bible tells us that Paul and Silas were dragged uh, into kind of like the center area, the merchant area where they had court, and they had court with them. And uh, the, 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 the accusation against them was they are preaching, these Jews are preaching a way of life that's foreign for us Romans. They're preaching a way of life, these Jews, it wasn't even Christian persecution, these Jews are proposing a way of life that is foreign to us Romans. And because of this accusation, the Bible says that they were beaten with rods and placed in prison. And uh, they, they're in prison and uh, they, they uh, had their legs put in stocks, you know, like we see in like the old time things that we somehow romanticize these days, bizarrely enough. Uh, and so their legs were in stocks. And we, we know this story because about midnight, the Bible says, Paul and Silas were uh, praying and singing songs to God. And uh, they must have been fairly amazing songs they were singing uh, because the Bible says about uh, midnight, uh, there was an earthquake that happened, right? 
and uh, all the gates were open, uh, the cells were open, and the prisoners' shackles were broken off, uh, and they were all free. And, and we love that story. Amen. I love that story. Don't you love that story? We love that story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's normally the story we hear around the time of, now I think we can clap a little better than that for the story. And uh, if you're in bondage, we love that story. I am one worship song away from absolute freedom, and it wasn't only absolute freedom that happened. Actually, the jailer found out that the cells were open, and uh, he knew that they were going to murder him for that, the people that he worked for, and so he was getting ready to kill himself, and Paul says, hey, hey, no, 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 we didn't go anywhere. We're right here. We didn't even go anywhere. We're free. We didn't even leave, and so the, he had been, uh, Paul had been obviously preaching to the jailer. The, the jailer got saved, took Paul and Silas home and fed them. His whole family got saved. I mean, that's a missionary story right there. We love those stories. I mean, I, his, like, we love these kind of stories where just like everything gets gooder and gooder. And, and, and it looks like we're going to have persecution. But not only did we not get persecuted, but the persecutors got saved. And they found out that we're right. And, and, and we love that. And we love teaching that. And we love preaching that. And, and, I, and, I, and I expect at any moment that God's going to break into my situation. And the, and the things that persecuted me are going to turn around and glorify God. Don't you believe that? And, I, and we just believe that. And that's, and that's faith. And I, and I absolutely believe that today. I believe that my worship can open heaven and change everything. The only problem is every day is not an Acts 16 day. And if you're new to Christ and you're living in this Christian bubble where everything is, is amazing and, and you're seeing unicorns and, 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 and stars everywhere because just things couldn't get more amazing in your life, I, I, I have a word for you. That's a season. That's a season. And if you think that everything is horrible and nothing is going your way, I have a word for you. It's a season. Yeah. It's a season. I would like every day to be an Acts 16 day, but life isn't always an Acts 16 day. And I'm not angry today, uh, but I do, um, I am somewhat grieved by a broken Christianity that tells everybody that every day is an Acts 16 day. And if it's not an Acts 16 day for you, there's probably something wrong with you. I'm, 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 I'm disappointed that we would preach this this foreign Christ. I, 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 I'm, I'm grieved by a Christianity that Paul would find foreign. I'm grieved about a Christianity that Peter would find foreign. That Thomas, who was martyred for his faith, would find foreign. I'm, I'm, I'm grieved about a Christianity that's being preached that I believe even Christ would find foreign. Wow. I, 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 you know... In Philippians, <laughs> if you're apostolic or prophetic, Philippians 3 and 4 are like your bedrock. You love these chapters. It's just like these chapters are like nothing around me is going exactly how I want it. But I am the one standing in truth, and it will all bend to the truth that I have on the inside of me. I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. My, I mean, that is my life scripture right there. I didn't realize it was an Enneagram type. I, I, you know, all, all I knew was that, like, I am not moved by what I see around me. But that very personality says that I'm going to see some things around me that don't line up with how things are supposed to be. And what do we do in those situations? <clears throat> Gosh, 23 minutes. <laughs> You've probably heard this scripture before, especially those who deal with anxiety. It's probably been preached to you. Be anxious for nothing. You know this, right? Be anxious for nothing but in all things, in prayer, in supplications, with thanksgivings. Let your requests be known to God. I mean, you've heard that, right? You've heard that, right? And, and when that scripture stands on its own, what it says is, don't be anxious, instead pray, and it's your prayers that take away the anxiety, and if you still have anxiety, it's probably a problem with your praying or your believing. Only problem is there's a sentence before that scripture that we rarely quote. The Bible says in Philippians 4, starting in verse 5, it says, the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing. Hear me. 
The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing but in all things. The perverted Christianity says it's all on you. And if you're not doing it right, then you might have anxiety. But if you're doing it right, then you won't have anxiety like us who fake away our anxiety. But the Bible actually says the Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. He's because you have an ever-present help in time of need. That's what he's saying. And if you is an ever-present help in time of need, that tells me there are going to be some times that you will have need. But the Lord is near. The Lord is near. The Lord is near. Yeah, that's a good word. Part of, part of the mandate on this house is to see healing for mental health. All kind of mental. That's part of the mandate on this house. And in order to walk in that mandate, first you have to actually acknowledge and recognize that there's people in the church with mental health needs. The scripture says the Lord is near, be anxious for nothing because some people have anxiety. And if we don't acknowledge that, then people can't get healed of anxiety. If we teach everybody that you have anxiety because you're not praying properly, then we're not actually helping. When you tell the depressed person, hey, why don't you just cheer up? You're not actually helping. That's not actually helping. It's almost like we're expecting them to say, oh, <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> Stop being depressed. <laughs> oh, woo! Thank you, prophet so and so. That's so, so helpful. I appreciate it. It's all gone now. I'm no longer depressed. You've told me to be happy. Why didn't I? Why didn't I think? Could you go away now, please? <laughs> you have to recognize it, and 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 you have to recognize. <clears throat> we have to recognize that God loves you. Not for who you will be, but for who you are. Amen. And people with sickness and, yeah, yeah, no, people with illness, there's, there's, there's like uh, this brand of Christianity that sees handicapped people as projects. As an opportunity for me to another, put another feather in my, my healing evangelist cap. As opposed to seeing whole people who just need a healing. This, this makes sense? Yeah. And, um, and I want everybody to be healed, and I want everybody to be delivered, but I want people to know that you're whole in Christ already. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. We're whole in Christ already. And I, I, I want people to, I, 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 I want to lift the shame off of people needing God. Period. So, Paul was in Philippi in Acts chapter 16, like I said, about 10 years after uh, the, the ministry of Jesus on earth. And about 10 years later, he has, he has, there's another connection with Philippi. He's writing a letter we call the book of Philippians, the book to the church in Philippi. Only the circumstances are very different now, 10 years after he saw this miraculous release from prison. Now... He's, he's actually in Rome writing to them as a prisoner. He was in Philippi and a, he was a song away from freedom, but now he's in prison in Rome. In Romans chapter 1, he tells them, hey, I long to come and preach to you. He feels this call to go to Rome and preach. And now he's in Rome, only he's not allowed to preach because he's a prisoner and he's actually chained to his guard. Now we know he has a private home, but I doubt it's that luxurious if he's chained to another human being, right? And he's able to have visitors come to him and he's able to write letters, but he's far from a free man. And so while he was with the Philippians, showing them the miracle power of God, now he's writing to the people in Philippi, the Philippians, as a prisoner who cannot get free. And as we talk about worship in the church today, I think we love the one part of Paul and Philippi, and we ignore the other part of Paul and Philippi because it doesn't necessarily breed into the American dream that I can be whatever I want to be. And the truth is, I, I can't. 
I can't be whatever I want to be because that's not the good news. The good news is I can be who God created me to be, regardless of my past, regardless of my circumstance, regardless of who I was raised with or where I find myself in this present time. The good news is that Jesus Christ has made a way for me to be everything God has caused me and called me to be. And I think because we've got this perverted, we've got worship completely perverted. I think we've completely confused what worship looks like. And I don't know if you've noticed, but every new young worship leader that comes out doesn't look any different than any new young star that comes out in the secular realm. They look identical. You got to be young. You got to be good looking. You got to have the look. And I just, there's, there's no 350 pound middle-aged worship leaders coming out. I don't know if you've noticed this or not. There isn't no, there aren't any blind one-legged worship leaders coming out. They got to be young and attractive. And we've somehow missed in the church what worship's supposed to be about. And I think we've confused the roles of worship. And Corey preached so well last week, and I'm thankful for his ministry. Would you just give me your hand with me for such a good, great job challenging us. And so I just very quickly just kind of want to kind of realign ourselves because we mix worship up with praise and praise up. We just use them interchangeably and we forget about Thanksgiving altogether. And because we don't understand these different things about worship, we don't understand what our role is in worship and what's actually required and expected of us in worship. You see, there is sometimes that you come into the house of God and you just don't feel that good. You've had a bad week. Your mind is going crazy. Maybe you have physical health issues. Maybe you have financial issues. Maybe you have family issues. Maybe you have relational issues. Maybe you have governmental issues. Maybe somebody you know was in Ohio or or was in the other locations where there were shootings just yesterday in Texas. Maybe you've come into the house of God and you don't feel that peppy today. Let me let you know that you're not broken and you don't have to hide that here. You don't have to. Actually, there is a place for that, and it's called the Church of Jesus Christ. And there's, see, see we, fr- we, we mix these things up, what this worship service is about before the preaching service. You see, the, the first thing we're going to talk about is Thanksgiving. You see, we come in, we feel like, oh, man, but God didn't come through for me, and so we can't worship. No, 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 that's called Thanksgiving. Th- th- Thanksgiving is different than worship. Thanksgiving is an act of gratitude. God, you came through for me. And I'm so thankful. God, I was crazy and you made me in my right mind. And I'm so thankful. I was in the dirt and now I'm not. I'm so thankful. But sometimes your problems are so big, it clouds out our thanksgiving. And we can't actually come into the house with thanksgiving as Corey commanded us last week. Come into the parking lot with thanksgiving. Come into the lobby with praise. And if we could just be honest, sometimes the problems of life are so strong, it chokes out our thanksgiving. If we have not cultivated a lifestyle of thanksgiving, it's easy to withdraw from thanksgiving. And then we come into the worship service and we can't even sing the songs because we don't feel thankful. But God has not called us necessarily to come to thanksgiving. Then there's praise. It's like, ah, I can't praise him right now because he has failed me. I'm still dealing with this thing or I'm still got this thing going on. And so it's very hard for me to lift up a praise. See, praise is is approval and it's admiration. Maybe you don't approve of what God has been doing recently in your life. Maybe you don't approve of the path he's put you on. You chose your path and emotionally you qualified yourself for a certain ministry, but God has not necessarily put you in that ministry yet and you don't approve of his ascension plan. You haven't approved of his plan to put you in ministry yet or you haven't approved of his plan to put you in a family or how the kids or the finances or maybe you haven't approved that. So you come in and worship and everybody's singing praise. You're like, I can't give praise because I don't necessarily, I wouldn't say this out loud, but I don't approve of what's happening. Does this make sense to anybody? And so you're just hearing the worship feeling heavy. But that's not what God has called us to. See, then there's worship. Worship is honor and reverence. You are required to show God. This is what a Christian is, someone who worships the living God. See, he is holy and we are not. He is the other one. He is the beautiful one. He is the magnificent one. He is the creator of heaven and earth. And he is the one who sent his son to die on a cross so I don't have to die in my sins. And for that, I worship 
him. I worship him with my life. I worship him with my heart. And regardless of my circumstances, regardless if he ever does anything for me again, he's worthy of my worship. Because he is God. He was worthy of my worship before he ever saved me. Because he is God. He was worthy of my worship. If he never sent his son to die on a cross for my sins, he is still worthy of my worship. And when we come in to the house of God, we are required to worship God. Because he is our Lord. He is our Savior. He is our King. And we are not. And today, I want to talk very briefly about the sacrifice of praise. The sacrifice of praise. Amen. Philippians chapter 4, we start in verse 10. I'm going to read a couple of verses here. This is Paul, of course. He's in Rome writing to the church in Philippi. The book of Philippians is to them. And uh, as, he, as, he, as, he, as he moves into this point, he's, uh, he's talking to the, the Philippians about like, he's like, hey, you know, we can do, we, 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 we <clears throat> excuse me. He, he's telling them like, I don't have to be anxious for anything. Got it all together. It's all a state of mind, whether or not we're happy or sad. I, I have learned, I've learned to live right, right? Like he's, he's telling them. Now, now, there was a time that they weren't able to support him. Paul is living in a house. We don't know what that means. That could be a shack. Uh, we, we don't know exactly, but we know he's chained to a guard. And uh, he's able to pay for that based on the offering sent to him by the churches that he helped establish. And some had not been able to help him because they didn't have the money. And some finally came through. And, and the church in Philippi finally sent him some money like they needed to do. And he says, but I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. What is that concern? You were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity not that I speak from want, for I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. He says, listen, I am excited because you finally sent some money to help support me. That you shared in my burden. That I am in prison and only have food if you send me money. I only have housing if you send me money. And you were able to actually help me out now with this. Let's go over verse 11 again. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. And I know how to live in prosperity. In any, in every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my afflictions. Literally, he's saying, since you have sacrificed to lift my burden, you share in my afflictions. And you have done well to do this. Let's skip to verse 16. He says, For even in Thessalonica you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. Here's a man in jail, chained to a guard. It says, I live in full and I have abundance. Let's skip to verse 19. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. amen. You've probably heard many of those verses before pulled completely out of this story and quoted over people's lives. Completely removed from the circumstance that you find them. Completely removed from the context of which they were written. Completely removed from, from the one who suffered his entire life to make those declarations. We just pluck them like an apple off a tree that we get to eat without planting any seeds. In verse 13, we see Paul talking about God's power. He says, I, I, can, I can do all things. And in verse 18, we see him saying about God's provision. I have all things, but we miss what he talks about. In verse 11, God's peace, he says in verse 11, not that I speak for want, for I have learned to be content. Let's say that together. Learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am in. The, the verb learned there means that I have gained this knowledge by experience. I have gained the ability to be content in whatever circumstance I am in. 
This contentment that he's talking about here, it talks about there is a, a self-sufficiency with the Spirit of God that is on the inside of him. That he needs nothing external for him to have peace. He needs nothing external to change for him to be at ease. He doesn't need the things around him because inside of him there is a contentment. There is a resource within him that doesn't have to depend on fake external resources. He's saying that through his trials, he has learned how to rely on Holy Spirit to meet his every need. In his reliance on Holy Spirit to meet every need in this passage, his need was met through other people being generous. He has learned to rely on Holy Spirit and Holy Spirit uses other people. And he says, I have learned to be content in every season because I know Holy Spirit will come through for me because I have learned that lesson through need and through abundance. He says, I have learned that with generosity in the midst of persecution, listen to this, he tells them, because you have been generous in the midst of your hardship, through the midst of your persecution, verse 19, he says, because of this, next verse, verse 19, he says, and my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. This is important. This is super, super important. You can quote this all you want, but if you're not living the prerequisites for it, it will not work for you. The blessing of prosperity that Paul is talking about is conditioned on a heart of generosity. I need you to learn this. this. This lesson is not about money. It's about worship, but I need you to get this. I need you to get this. This blessing. He said, God will supply all of your needs. Why did he say that? Because they were supplying God's needs. God's need was on Paul's life right there. Paul needed something. And he trusted God to come through. And God used a group of people to be generous. And he said, because you will listen to Holy Spirit and be generous, where Holy Spirit said, God will supply all your needs richly. <laughs> richly supply all your needs. Because you've allowed God to make you the source of my supply, I am declaring that God will be the source of your supply. You see this. Here's why good theology is important. Without good theology, we just pick a verse out because somebody in the 13th century decided to chop up the Bible in chapter and verses. You know, the Jews never did that until the Christians did it. They were all just stories. It was all stories until the Christians decided to chop up the Bible and then the Jews did it in the Old Covenant. And because we did that, we pick out something, we see a number next to it, must be a promise for me. But it just doesn't work that way. Bad theology says that if you just are depressed, if you pray right, then you won't be depressed anymore. Bad theology says if you can quote the right scripture, you'll have whatever you want and it's just not true. We used to live in a social media age, and now we've gone even beyond that. You know, Instagram, you would have these photos, right? You put it on Instagram. We, we, we're all on Instagram, right? And you kind of scroll, and once you've scrolled past a picture, it's, you're done. That picture is no longer part of your life. Once, once your friend, you love it, you look at it, oh, look at their family moment, it's amazing, and then you scroll past, and now you're all caught up. You know everything, you don't need to revisit it anymore. The past is the past. And now, that was too permanent because you can at least do a deep dive in the people's Instagram. Now they have Instagram stories one day and it's gone. A 20 second clip on social media and then it's gone. And I have friends who are popular on social media who are preachers and I see their 20 second clips and they have the 40 billion likes on them. And I'm like, wow, that's that's amazing. It's amazing that so many people have liked and shared a thought that is so unbiblical. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, this is amazing. I love you. I love your heart. And I know what you want to impart to people. But that is not what that verse says. And that is not the context of it. And that is not actually what God is promising through that story. And if, and if people attach your teaching to their soul, they will be let down by God. And you are not helping 
It's, you're, it's not helping. You, everybody knows, everybody, if you've ever done any level of street witnessing, if you've ever shared your faith with people who, who, who just on a regular basis, you'll hear people to say, well, I, I used to be a Christian, but then, and then they tell you their disappointment. They tell you about the person who got sick and died and they prayed and nothing happened or they lost the house, they lost the business and this disappointment came and God wasn't there and God failed me and now I don't follow him. It's no one, you don't, it's impossible for you to be witnessing regularly and you not have a hundred stories like that. Bad theology. Who told you that nobody is going to die? Who told you that you would have a better life than Jesus had? Who promised us this? The Bible doesn't. Bad theology does. And like Instagram stories, like I was on vacation this week with my family and it was amazing. We just had an amazing vacation. I did zip lining in the mountains, which was amazing because we don't have mountains or zip. Like I saw your zip line pictures in central Florida and there's trees and you're going from one tree to another tree. And I'm like, that doesn't look that exciting. I went from one mountain to another mountain to another mountain. To, and this was amazing. And we posted these videos on social media and you can look at these videos and you can be like, wow, look at the Thomas family zip lining in Puerto Rico. What an amazing. And if that's all you knew about my family, you will be sorely, sorely, sorely disappointed in your life. However, that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story. We didn't get married and go ziplining in Puerto Rico. It's been a 20-year journey of trying to get out of debt and get out of poverty and try to work our marriage out to something that's healthy and raise kids that we actually want to spend a little bit of time with. It's, it's been a 20-year process to get to ziplining in Puerto Rico. It's been a 20-year process. And in the church... These days in their 20-second Instagram clips are preaching outcome, and we need to be preaching process. We have to be preaching process. You preach some outcome, you can fill a room, but you preach some process, you'll fill a heart. You know, we might actually fill heaven. We might fill heaven, and that's our goal. Amen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Bad theology hurts people. Bad theology hurts people. They, they teach that this walk costs nothing, that you'll have to give up nothing. Uh, we set people up for disappointment. Holy camoly. Uh, and eventually they lose faith in God and that's our fault. They tell everybody, you can have everything right now. And if you don't, I have to make reasons up why you didn't get it. And it's always your fault. It's your lack of faith. Maybe it's your sin. It's Maybe you're not spiritual enough. I don't know, something. But it's your fault. We need to learn how to operate in the kingdom of God. And there's processes that we have to learn. In an Insta, in an Insta story age, we have to teach our kids, what does it look like to worship? You've seen the, the week we've had. You've seen what we've been through. You, you've, seen, you've seen mom and dad fight on the way to church. And now here we are worshiping. And we're not hypocrites because God is worthy of our worship. Yeah, exactly. I'm so convicted of this. I've been talking with Sarah, who's our Revival Kids Director. We're, we're figuring out, and this is happening very soon, how we're going to get the elementary age kids in here for worship. And then we'll release them after worship, go back there. No, no, I don't care if you like it or not. It's good. The kids need to learn it. The kids need to learn how the family worships. Families need to worship together. They need to see like, man, I've had a hard week, and I'm not up here just saying everything's great. I'm saying, and still God is God. Still God is God. We need to worship together. We need to teach our kids this is what worship looks like. In Hebrews 13, 15, Paul writes, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Listen, when, when you just got a raise and you come in here, it ain't a sacrifice of praise. When everything's working out and you're on the mountaintop and everybody's calling you blessed, it ain't a sacrifice. Then you got the bubbling up and running over. It's easy to just give God some of the overflow, right? Yeah. A sacrifice when the week went bad. Yeah. A sacrifice of praise is when things are, you're still in the midst, of the midst of disappointment and it ain't been a week or a month or a year, but it's been about a minute. You know what I mean? Like you've been in it for a minute and yet you still come in and you raise your hands and you offer a sacrifice to God. 
God, you are worthy. Nothing in me feels this way, but I know that you're worthy of praise and honor, glory and thanksgiving and majesty. I offer you a sacrifice of praise right now. I don't have anything to give, but yet I give right now a sacrifice of praise. Hear me. Paul says to the church in Philippi, your sacrifice for me, because of that, I'm telling you, God will provide for your needs. I'm telling you today, the Lord told me this morning, as you sacrifice your praise to him, he will supply you something to be praising for. Can you hear what I'm telling you? If you will offer him a sacrifice of praise, Lord, I don't have anything praiseworthy in my life right now, but yet I still give you praise and honor. God says, I will supply your need for something to praise me over. I will come through and I will bring something to your house as that you can bring as a sacrifice of praise. Hallelujah. 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 I'm telling you, we need to learn this. We need to learn it good. We need to learn it good. God is worthy of it. There's mountaintop experiences, but there are low valley experiences. And among the 150 psalms, you know, the psalms are all songs, right? You know, they're all songs to be sung. You know, you go to a, 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 a Jewish uh, service, they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't read the psalms, they sing them. There's two ministers in a Jewish service. There's the rabbi and there's the cantor. Cantor is a singer. He leads the singing. We didn't make up the worship leader and preacher. I mean, we didn't come up with that on our own. It's actually came before us. And so the cantor or the singer of the 150 songs in the Bible, the Psalms, almost a third of them are songs of lament, songs of grief, songs of, man, things are not well. A third of them almost. And yet we teach the church that if you're not happy, clappy, there's something wrong with you. I don't believe there was something wrong with the Bible or something wrong with David that he wrote them. And they all follow this pattern of taking notes. You want to write this down. This is going to be good stuff. They all follow these psalms of lament, follow this pattern. It starts with a cry to God. God, oh, do you hear me? God, do you see me? Then, watch this, there's a complaint about what is wrong. There's nothing wrong with complaining to God. That's just telling him what ain't going right. There's a complaint to God. God, why have you not come through for me yet? I don't understand. But then you don't stop there. There's a confession of trust that God will deliver. Then there's a petition calling on God to intervene. I want you to notice that there's a confession that he will deliver before there is asking him to deliver. Finally, there's a promise to praise God when the breakthrough comes. This is the, this is the style of the Psalms of lament. A cry to God, a complaint about what is wrong, a confession of trust that God will deliver. There's a petition calling on God to intervene. There's a promise to praise God when deliverance comes. Anxiety and insecurity cause you to do dumb things and not trust God. Anxiety and insecurity will cause you to do dumb things. One time, David was anxious about the size of his army, and he wanted to count them to make sure they're all good. And God's like, don't do that. I want you to trust me. And he's like, man, I need, I, need, I need to know. I just need to know. I need to know. I need to know. God's like, don't do that. And he did it anyways. And David went and counted his army, and God sent a curse and as punishment because he'd sinned against God and started striking people dead and a prophet Gad told David, listen, if you want to you fix this thing, you're going to go and you're going to build an a- a altar on Ornan's land and uh, on Ornan's threshing floor. Why this guy had to lose his threshing floor, I don't know. But Ornan was there uh, on his threshing floor and an angel showed up, freaked out him and his four sons. They all hid. And then David came up and said to Ornan, hey, the Lord has told me I have to stop this plague. And in order for me to do it, I need to, I need to set up an altar right here. And I need to buy your land and I need to buy your oxen so that I can sacrifice them on the altar. And, and Ornan saw the angel and he's like, no way, man. I'm not selling you anything. You can have it all. But David, David says this, 2 Samuel 2.24. He says, however, the king said, 
to earn them. No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. For I will not offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God, which cost me nothing. I will not offer a sacrifice that cost me nothing. And so David bought the place and he bought the oxen and he sacrificed them and the, and the curse ended. It's all wonderful when you come in here with a fistful of testimonies. But at some point, you've got to offer him a sacrifice that cost you something. There's a worship. Come, Corey. Listen, true worship is powerful because it cost you something. It cost you something. It, and you said, man, I will not. I will not just come here and act like everything's okay. Some of us, it's going to cost you just dropping the shell, dropping the fake. Stop faking it around here like you got it all together and come and open a door of brokenness and let God see the ugliness in front of people and say, God, in the midst of my ugliness, I worship you for who you are. And you lose your mind in Christ and you lose your mind in worship and you lay on the floor and you swear you weep like a child and you sob like the broken one that you are and you offer it as a sacrifice yes. of praise. Can you hear what I'm telling you right now? <clears throat> Real worship is surrender. Real worship is about encountering and experiencing God's presence. Real worship is an act of spiritual warfare. Despite what's going on around me, yet I will still worship God. Yeah. We have a song written in house that's a, that's a true lament. I know Corey didn't know this. He probably didn't know the word when he wrote it. But it's a true lament. We sang it this morning. Can you put the lyrics to this song up from the beginning? Can you go back to the worship part and put the lyrics up? And we're going to stand and we're going to sing this in a moment. <clears throat> Can you go back to the beginning? Because you put up what I wrote, but I don't know that I got the words right. Let's just be honest. That's the song. Okay. When the walls that I've built to protect me all come crumbling down, the lies I believed I'm rejecting, I know I can trust you right now. You're my strong tower, my anchor in the waves. When waters rise up, Lord, I will call on your name. Keep it going. When your love and your goodness surround me, my fears have nowhere to hide. The lies that once used to drown me are now drowned by the love in your eyes. You're my strong tower, my anchor in the waves. When waters rise up, Lord, I will call on your name. I know I can trust you. You are who you say you are. And in the bridge, he says, your peace, my promise, your joy, my strength, your blood is my deliverance, your life in me. That's a psalm of lament. I need God. Stand with me if you would. And I want to offer him just a sacrifice of worship. And I really believe today, if you will open to Holy Spirit, ha, ha. And allow him, hmm. if, you, if you will just be aware of the areas that you're hiding from us and hiding from God. And you will sing from that place of hurt. I, I don't want you to be depressed. I don't want you to be sad. I don't want you to be anxious. But I don't want you stuffing it somewhere you don't visit either. Amen. That's what you need to bring to church. Not your happy, clappy, prosperity Christianity where things are good and getting gooder. We need you to sing songs from your anguish. We need you to worship out of your lack. We need you to give out of your need so that God can supply all, richly supply all of your need through Christ Jesus. Ready, Corey? Let's sing it together. When the walls that I've built to protect me all come crumbling Take off some of the reverb if you would. Now. 
In the lies I believed I'm rejecting I know I can trust you right now You're my strong tower My anchor in the waves When waters rise up Lord, I will call now listen, let's do it for real this time. I want you to come, I want you to sing from an area of hurt, anxiety, abandonment, disappointment. That's where you need to declare this, not, not, not in your happy place. You ready now? Do it, Corey. When the walls that have built to protect me all come crumbling down in the lies i believed i'm rejecting i know i can trust you right now you're my strong tower my anchor in the waves when waters rise up Lord, I will call on your name. When your love and your goodness surround me, and my fears have nowhere to hide, the lies that once used to drown me, Drowned by the love in your eyes Come on You're my strong tower My anchor in the waves When waters rise up Lord, I will call on your name I know I can trust you week with a heart of worship, with a heart of thankfulness, and, and just knowing that God is faithful. We're going to remind you guys all that we have the beach picnic this evening at um, South Inlet Park at 5 p.m. If you're a guest, we'd love to meet you in the lobby. And if you need prayer um, for healing or deliverance or want someone to agree with you for prayer, there will be the altar ministry team will be up here. You can stay here and worship and give a sacrifice of praise. God bless you guys.